Thank you everyone for, for joining us today. Uh, my name is Matt and I'm joined by my colleague Alejandro who I'll introduce uh, in just a second. And today's topic is looking at Altair's solutions for structural engineers in the AEC industry related to meshing and how you can use these solutions to achieve your designs, uh, potentially complex, potentially large models. Um, we're gonna look at that in a little bit more uh, in the next few minutes. So once again, my name is Matthew Sauer. Um, I am in Vancouver, Canada. I'm also joined by my colleague, Alejandro Nguera. Uh, he's in London in the United Kingdom. Uh, you've probably heard from both of us in the past. We are um, primarily the ones that have presented the S-Frame topics and we're excited to talk to you. This is the third of four Altair Solution uh, series webinars uh, that we're gonna be talking about today. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about HyperWorks and its open architecture throughout the presentation. We're also gonna do a comparison of uh, the meshing solutions that we have at Altair, uh, what we'll call HyperMesh or HyperWorks versus the mesh-free solution that I know a number of you have seen already, uh, SimSolid. Uh, it's natural to have questions about why to use one versus the other uh, and when one might be appropriate. Uh, so we're gonna touch on that as well. We'll go through an example looking at uh, one-dimensional mesh creation within HyperWorks as well as a 2D mesh. And then Alejandro is gonna look at 3D meshing and some of the mesh editing tools that are very cool, very useful uh, that are available within HyperWorks. And as I mentioned already, the Altair AE Suite, excuse me, Altair AEC Suite uh, includes a number of new uh, solutions that for those of you coming from SRAM software uh, might not necessarily have ex been exposed to yet. We've run a variety of webinars already on these solutions. Uh, we've run a webinar on SimSolid, the fast alternative design with mesh Free solver. We've done a webinar on uh, 1D and th uh, 3D optimization. And today's topic is on meshing. Uh, next webinar in line uh, will be the fourth of the series is on computational fluid dynamics. And there is some overlap between these two topics that uh, we'll touch on more. But as you can see, there's quite a wide range of topics um, within the Altair AAC suite. Uh, so hopefully over time, you'll be able to learn more about each one of them. But as mentioned today, we're gonna to be talking about meshing. In fact, this image that we're showing here is one that Alejandro is gonna be driving you through later on. So you'll be able to learn a little bit more about this example. So let's talk about what we'll be discussing uh, throughout this presentation. I'm gonna to touch a little bit on uh, the differences between the mesh-free solution versus the meshing uh, solution that we have within Altair. Uh, Altair is famous for their, their meshing capabilities, um, but we also have a solution that doesn't use any mesh. And we've already presented that to a number of you, and there's probably the natural question of which one to use when. Uh, so hopefully we can answer some of those questions uh, within that section of the presentation. As mentioned already, we'll go into some one-dimensional modeling, uh, 2D meshing, and then also uh, 3D meshing. And then looking at how we can use uh, morphing capabilities and some mesh editing tools uh, throughout, but uh, we have a section actually dedicated to morphing at the end. So how you can adopt the geometry to your, your CAD model uh, quite easily. So I'm gonna start with uh, the comparison between a mesh and mesh-free solution. And this is a very high level description. So, you know, there certainly is more that can be discussed and um, whatnot, but I'm gonna to touch on this a little bit more here since some of you have seen uh, SimSolid already. Now we're not talking about SimSolid today, so I'm not gonna to spend too much time, but uh, really what I wanna focus on is HyperWorks, which is uh, the Altair meshing solution. So it allows you to import models uh, or you can create your own models from scratch. And you can work with one dimensional, two dimensional or 3D mesh. The SimSolid solution is working with 3D geometry. So that may be one of the differences you see right off the bat. Another great tool within HyperWorks is the ability to easily adjust your mesh after it's been created using class leading morphing capabilities amongst other mesh editing uh, controls. It's got built-in structural optimization and it also interfaces with a wide range of solvers for different types of analysis, whether it is uh, structural analysis of last loading or CFD or thermodynamics. And you even have access to third party solvers. So it's a solver agnostic uh, meshing solution uh, is really, I think, a good way of looking at that. So if you have a favorite solver within your organization, you don't necessarily need to use Altair solvers for that um, if you prefer to use your 
pre-existing solver, you can still use HyperWorks as the front end and the back end for that. Now, for those of you that maybe have missed the SimSolid presentation, uh, as we go on, I'll paste the link to that webinar into the, into the chat uh, so that you have access to it. It's a presentation we did earlier this year uh, that talks more about the mesh-free solutions. So you may be wondering, well, why do I use HyperWorks? Well, it does allow a lot of uh, potential for your models. It's great for faster model development. Uh, if you're working with different disciplines, it's also great to interact with those disciplines in an efficient way and explore different model alternatives um, much faster than you might have been able to. Now, HyperWorks has been recognized for the last 30 years as the best solution for meshing in a variety of industries. And HyperWorks itself is the official measure for many companies and for many products and projects around the world. So hopefully you'll be able to find some applications for it within your workflow. Now I'm gonna jump into the next topic, which is 1D meshing solutions. And this is something that, again, you probably already have uh, tools that are able to do this, but there are some very unique, uh, and I would say nice workflows within this that uh, could certainly lend some value to a lot of our structural engineers uh, daily lives. So when it comes to meshing with 1D members, uh, first of all, you can generate a beam member, uh, you can edit the members and so on. There's actually a built-in section calculator. So for those of you that may be used to using S-Frame um, and S-Calc, it's very similar to S-Frame with a built-in S-Calc, like you see there. There's also a handy tool called uh, the section cut tool. And for the section cut tool, you can actually import any geometry into HyperWorks. And what it will do is it will identify edges and create your sections. And this can be especially useful uh, in the case of, for example, complex extruded shapes. So let's use the example that you have a 3D CAD geometry of a, a solar panel structure that's got fairly unique extruded shapes. You can use the sections from the CAD and then apply them to future members that you might draw and uh, it will automatically create those sections for you based on that section cut of the CAD geometry. There is also a mesh inflate uh, tool, which is used to generate 2D and 3D meshes. So you can go from a one-dimensional or two-dimensional CAD geometry and then mesh into 2D or even 3D, depending on your application. So I know we're talking about 1D mesh in this section, but you know this can easily be expanded to more um, more dimensions if you wanted it to. Now I've got an example here. It's a video that one of my colleagues helped me uh, uh, record here, uh, and it's looking at how to set up a beam. So it's fairly simple geometry, but it's a great way to kind of introduce you to the interface and some of the tools that you might be able to use. So I'm just gonna play this here and I'll narrate over top of it. So we're starting here with the beam and we've got uh, a tube section that's been applied already actually but we have this built-in sketcher that allows us to sketch the desired sections that we might want. So we can apply that new section, in this case here, it's a wide flange shape uh, by, to the sketch, um, from the sketch to the beams. And we also have calculated properties that came from that sketcher. So we're able to look at the section properties that have been determined for us from the section uh, property analysis. We can see that beam there. We can also assign variables to allow for parametric shape adjustments on the fly. So we can change the width of the flanges, for example, here, and it's going to modify that member. We can also change the height of the, uh, the web. And we can go back into the sketcher at any point and make additional changes. So let's say here that, you know what, I want to reinforce this section. I want to add a plate onto the bottom of it. I can just left click and drag, draw in my plate. And once I've drawn it in, I can also assign a dimension. And with this dimension here, it might not be a nice round number yet, but we can make it a variable. And we can say, okay, let's give this variable a name. And then once we name it here, we can also assign a new value or a new dimension to that uh, variable. So we can go back into the overall structural model and we can see that plate there. But then I can say, let's go back to the sketch and look at our variables and that variable I just created, let's change this to a different value. So I have a, a wider plate now on this and all the properties will update accordingly. 
So that variable manager in a sketcher is certainly a nice way to, to modify your, um, your beam model in this case very easily. Um, and obviously we know that you have other tools for doing this sort of thing, but this, within the same solution, you can also explore some of the other meshing capabilities that uh, both myself and Alejandro will be talking about in just the next few minutes. So let me go to the next slide here. And we're gonna talk more about 2D meshing. Uh, since the 1D meshing, while it certainly is powerful, uh, I think most of what uh, I guess differentiates HyperMesh from some of the other tools out there is its ability to do 2D and 3D mesh as well. So when it comes to 2D mesh, uh, there may be situations where you might have a CAD geometry, for example, that you want to import and you want to be able to mesh it and run your analysis to observe the behavior, the stresses and so on. And that can be a time consuming process in conventional uh, FEA programs, but HyperWorks has a built in mid surfacing capability to generate the mid surface for you automatically. You can obviously override it, but then it can definitely ease the import process and the pre-processing that's needed before you actually run the analysis. So it has all these great tools for cleaning up your CAD geometry uh, be because obviously you want good CAD coming in, but that may not necessarily always be the case. It doesn't need to be perfect. You can clean it up and we'll go through an example later on. And then once you've cleaned up the geometry, you want to be able to mesh and there may be situations where you need to override the default mesh that's been created. There's a lot of easy ways to do that within the software. And maybe just to, to kind of go back a step, when we're talking about 2D meshes, well, you can use 2D meshes for all sorts of things. Um, but where I've seen it used, at least within the AAC industry, is for things like slabs, maybe walls, uh, foundation pads, um, bridge decks, those sorts of things. There's obviously a lot more applications. We see an example here of a steel node connection, and we're going to go into this uh, actually in an example later on. Uh, but hopefully it gives you a bit better idea of what we're referring to here. So I've got another video here uh, that I'm going to play for you in just a second. This is actually a larger model. Uh, so this is a larger multi-story building structure and we're working with CAD geometry on this one. So I'm just going to play the video and I might stop it uh, or pause it from time to time. Uh, but we're working with CAD geometry and the nice part about working with CAD geometry is that the associated groups uh, and parts, as we'll call it in HyperWorks, are included in the model and it helps us organize things. And in this case here, some geometry cleanup is required. And I might just pause this here. Just give me a second. Some geometry cleanup is required as uh, by design for this example here. Um, not all of our elements were in contact with one another. And we wanted that to be the case before meshing. So we have this uh, connectivity review here, and you can see that there's different colored elements that I'm showing within this, in this screenshot. And I just wanna explain it a little bit more. So we have different colors, we have red, we have green, and we have yellow. And they represent the types of connectivity that we have within each element. So red essentially means that that edge is disconnected from any other edge. The green represents that that edge is connected uh, to one other object. So we have some green around the core walls here and some of our core wall connections to the slabs. And then yellow means that it's connected to one or more uh, or more than one other object. And we have tools to connect these things. So it, this was done by design. We actually wanted this geometry to be imperfect because we wanted to use some of the CAD cleanup tools within HyperWorks. So what we're gonna do here is we're actually gonna use this cross extend tool and we're gonna actually define the source that will extend as the core and then the target is a slab to extend and fill the gap between the core and the slab. So that's what we're doing right now. We're just selecting the target and the source and we're gonna apply those uh, parameters and then extend to one another. And you might be able to see here in just a second that the colors of each element have changed. I went through that very quickly. Now we can go through the meshing process and auto mesh this now that everything is touching and we can choose the element sizes and so on. And if we zoom in, we'll be able to see the mesh that's been generated. Now the elements are automatically split up based on their components and stored in folders that contain the geometry in their mesh. And in this case here, we can zoom in and see uh, what we're dealing with. Um, and I may actually wanna create, in this case here, I'm gonna create a beam along the edge of the slab as a reference line for our structural beams. 
So here I'm just selecting those objects. And I'm going to select the edges of each beam uh, of each slab here, and I'm going to create beams along the edges. And I'm going to assign a property here, a beam section. And we'll be able to see that if we zoom in here. So I've got this wide flange beam uh, that was defined in the sketcher we'll look at later on. But I can apply the properties, I can make different changes. So if I wanted to edit this beam, I can change the orientation or the offset. In this case here, I may want to change the offsets um, of these 1D elements. And what I can do is I can change that offset and it will automatically recognize the position of the slab and the relative position of the shear center of the, of the member and automatically create rigid offsets for the solver to use. So I can say, you know, I want this to be underneath my slab or flush with the slab, and it will be able to do that for us on mass. Now I've also done here is I've used a keyboard to isolate uh, some beams of interest. Uh, then we can assign a, a circle section here. I use this tube section and apply it to my columns. So I'm just assigning these as beams and drawing these in as columns here. And with just a click of a or a selection of my mouse here, I can apply those properties to the relative or the relevant members. And it's going to mesh to create those 1D elements. And we'll be able to look at that in the 3D view to see what we're working with. Now, obviously, I had those Y flange shapes around the edge of my slab. And I can go into the sketcher and modify those shapes or any other shape that I might have defined uh, within the sketcher, assign variables, and so on. Uh, so I do still have that control, even though I'm working within the 2D environment this time. Uh, or 2D meshing versus 1D meshing. There's a mixture of the two shapes. I've got one more example here that I'll share with you. Uh, let me just continue on. So this is an example of a complex steel node geometry. And this was actually imported from a CAD software. So in this case here, we're starting with what I'm going to refer to as a 3D solid geometry. We're starting with a CAD model that we're importing into Hyperworks. And for those of you that work with CAD models, uh, you know that you're not, they're not typically set up in a way that you can run an analysis quickly. That goes for uh, bringing in data from a CAD software into S-Frame even. Uh, you need to do some, some work on it before it's really ready to go. But what I want to highlight here is how quickly and easily that can be done with some of these built-in tools. So this is the CAD geometry that we're working with, and we want to create a 2D shell model from it. So we use this technique called mid-surfacing and Hyperworks actually has built-in mid-surfacing tools that can automate this process. So we can select which we want to mid-surface and we may find that there are certain areas that we don't like and we can always use built-in tools to edit that mid-surface model until we're satisfied with it. So there's a lot of different tools to help us modify it as much as we need uh, until we're satisfied with what it's given us. Now, we may also want to defeature the model for meshing. Uh, that might involve removing holes or baffles with the built-in tools. Uh, this is just done to simplify the geometry for intended purposes. It's not necessarily required, but it might be, um, you know, just better for us in that case if those details aren't required. So here we're removing some of the, the baffles. And in this example here, we're using a cross-extend tool that we looked at earlier to extend the, the uh, webs of this model of this beam here to the, the node itself. So as you can see, there's a lot of different ways that we can edit the geometry to prepare for meshing. Hyperworks itself isn't a CAD software, but it gives us a lot of control over the geometry that actually avoids the need for us to constantly go back and forth between CAD to get our surface analysis just right for meshing. And once we're satisfied, we can click on the mesh option and we can generate our mesh. So here we've generated a fairly coarse mesh, but we can refine it as much as we like. We can set the mesh size. We can even do it for the radial pattern around the edges of our circle here, and the mesh will update accordingly. We can draw a line in our mesh to trim the mesh to and create joints along that length. For example, if we have a line load on that location. We can also easily modify the generated mesh to optimize what we've come up with. So we can manually edit elements with undesired aspect ratios. Uh, until we're satisfied with what it's come up with. And the beauty of this all is that it's using 
an automatic property assignment on an object basis. So if we want to apply a thickness to an object, we can do that quite easily. We don't need to click on every single shell to assign the desired thickness. We can actually do it on an object by object basis. So for the flange of one of our beams or for the uh, one of the circular members that's come in, we can certainly use that type of capability for that. And here we're just reviewing the assigned uh, thicknesses in a contour diagram. So you can see the different thicknesses throughout. Again, if I wanted to apply a, a different thickness to this portion of this uh, tube section here, I wouldn't have to left click and drag on every single uh, shell. I could just apply it to that part, uh, which is defined in the CAD geometry, and it's all associated with the mesh as well. So we've been talking about 2D meshing. Uh, surface meshing is also very important during a CFD analysis. And in this case here, we wanna make sure that the surface conditions are gonna be accurately represented. Now here's an example of where we're trying to illustrate the vast quantity of elements that are required to accurately represent wind conditions for the purposes of pedestrian comfort analysis. Maybe hard to really make out the details because you can see some larger sections, but as we get into these buildings themselves, uh, the amount of elements that are used is actually so much that we, we just can't make out the difference between the, the edges and the, the interior. Uh, but Hyperworks can actually handle huge amounts of mesh uh, with ease. So it, it can, you can have tens, potentially hundreds of millions of elements, and it can still handle that. And the beauty as well is that Hyperworks can handle different solvers. It is solver agnostic, agnostic sorry. So it's not just for structural solvers. It can be used to accurately model mechanisms, fluids, electromagnetics, and much more. And I see there are a few questions about CFD analysis. I'm glad that you guys are interested in that. It is actually something that we have a dedicated webinar for. Uh, it's going to be happening in November. Uh, and it does talk about these types of things in more detail. So if you're interested in that, I'd say let's touch base in November. Uh, we're going to have a webinar on that. Good way to keep in touch on that is to join our email list. We'll have some more information about that later on. But I think next I'm going to hand the keys over to Alejandro. Alejandro, do you mind taking control and just making sure that we can hear you? Yes, Matt. Uh, thank you. So hopefully I'll be sharing my screen now. Yes, I can see it now. Thank you. Yep. Thank you very much. So yes, my, um, as my colleague Matt mentioned, I'm just going to proceed with the 3D meshing part of this uh, presentation today. Now, when, when we see 3D, uh, we think about, the first thing we, we need to think about are solid elements. And this could be of two types so as uh, exomesh and tetramesh, the main ones. And solid elements are generally used for 3D structures, which are not fitting into the shell description. Castings, forgings, block structures, and volumes are all good examples of the 3D solid element structures. These solid elements have the benefit of eliminating many assumptions, as engineers do, uh, that found in other element types, but also more generally, uh, also generally more difficult to, to model. Now, when comparing these two methods, uh, the goal in choosing which one particular type of mesh to use, whether it's hexahedral or tetrahedral type of mesh, uh, the engineer needs to be careful and find the best balance between simulation accuracy, computational time, convergence rate, and the difficulty in generating these numerical models within one meshing technique. Now, uh, let's take a look at some of the examples uh, using this uh, stamp model you see here. So I'm just gonna play a recording and narrate over it. So here's an extra mesh of a dam model. So we can rotate it to see the different faces of the dam. And we have some tools to see the interior of this dam. We see it has some channel uh, tower pipes. And we can start with a geometry operation. So we proceed uh, to, to simplify this model. Apologies for the spelling mistake there. Uh, we just isolate one section of the dam since the other sections are the same ones. And we have some a plug tool where we can which we can use to select the cavities to extract the empty internal parts and focus on these. 
Then we can come back to our original view and select one circular cavity in order to select the entire piece. Once we isolate the tower pipe, we can proceed with the next step. Uh, using one of the features in Hyperworks, uh, the box tool, uh, we can create uh, some exterior boxes like uh, the ones you are about to see. So here's the box tool. And what is being done here is just creating some uh, square tubes with the aim of simplifying the round tube uh, with a square tube pipe. And we can easily extend uh, the surface of these rectangular objects around the tubes to the entire piece. We see it in green color. And see how the software takes a special care of, <clears throat> of those areas uh, with angles where the connections are. Then we can select the square objects. Uh, we see them in, in yellow color. And with some tools, uh, we can replicate this in the other tube, which is right next to it. Now, we can proceed with a Boolean operation to simplify the original CAD by subtracting the new simplified hole with a new one. The new object that we created is bigger than the original, as we can see, but we still have the same dam. But only this time inside, the same tubes are now simplified. And this is known as an escalation process. When looking at this section of the dam, uh, we can proceed and cut in mappable parts to, uh, before proceeding with the XMesh. For this step, the XMesh, uh, you need to make sure your CAD is mappable. It's very important. And soon divide the, card, uh, the CAD into smaller pieces by selecting uh, some planes and divide them. Uh, experience is needed for this step, but you can map every element. And the user has many tools, uh, like the use of uh, planes, surfaces, extruded lines. There are many ways to achieve this. And once this is done, uh, we can see the end result. So we select, uh, the, the software will automatically identify the best sequence to extrude the surf source surfaces to complete the XMesh. Uh, the pink lines uh, basically indicate the extrusion direction, while the number, which is right next to it, is the order in when the extrusion is gonna be realized. If we zoom in, we see the different surfaces uh, of the current planes. And these are the source surfaces, uh, like the 2D mesh surf used uh, to start the extraction part, the, the extraction path, sorry. If you need to change or reduce the mesh size, uh, you have uh, ways to do so. You have the same tools to create the 2D mesh that my colleague Matt uh, mentioned earlier, or uh, portion and be more detailed. This will be very fast and clean to make uh, the new mesh. And we can uh, zoom in and zoom out to see the different plane directions. Uh, now, when we proceed with the XMesh working, we can see it there. Uh, I just applied uh, some spirit view of the process. It may take a couple of minutes. This is just a spirit view. And once it's done, uh, we can zoom in to appreciate the, the end result, uh, the XMesh, where all the mesh planes ended up in quadrilateral. Uh, solids. Now, that was an example of the XMesh. Uh, what about the TetraMesh? Well, the TetraMesh will be uh, fairly more simple with a few lower steps, a uh, fewer steps. So we have the same damn model. Uh, we just go to the solids part and apply uh, an average size. Uh, we select the parts where we can apply these uh, average mesh uh, parameters and we just click mesh. Uh, this is another spirit uh, view. Uh, since it takes uh, uh, some time, but not as, as much as EXA. And then by defining some uh, section cuts, I can define, uh, I can define the, the plane, uh, the axis in which I would like to look my final end result. So here's the end result, taking care of the cavities. And we can use, um, this view to go to the top where I have the, the other cavities uh, at the top of my dam. So everything about the mesh 
of the Tetra is taken care of by the software. Now, when it comes to morphing, Hyperworks uh, morphing tool uh, basically allows users changing the final element model shape without having to sacrifice the mesh quality. Uh, this can be used by users to create shapes and then afterwards design the optimization uh, for studies. And next, we will see an example of this uh, same uh, dam, but using the morphing tool. In general, morphing, the morphing step is not needed for, for XMesh. It's very important to take this into consideration, but we decided to show, since the, we have this very complex model, uh, and this is for a more completed scenario. So here is an example for morphing uh, in the original geometry that we ended up in the XMesh example. You can uh, <clears throat> appreciate uh, the morphing that we apply to the dam after it's meshed. And we see that the morphing acts directly on the mesh and see the outcome right away. We do have some parameters to change the shape and play it accordingly to see the original versus the modified morph shape. Then other tools allow us, uh, like the contour plot uh, tool, we can see the movement of each joint which is plotted. In this case, uh, projecting the nodes of the mesh on the simplified CAD. The nodes are projected based on the real geometry. And we see the nodes converging with the original geometry, and we can go back. And notice some similar changes at the bottom of the, of the dam, uh, the dam tube that we defined earlier. We can check the preview of the shape and how the morphing is applied. And at the end, we can see the resultant mesh when replicating this work with other sections of the dam. For example, if we take a cross section to see it more clearly, uh, let's find a view where we can see the little door and the cavity that goes to the bottom uh, right here. So we can use the, the tools uh, to advance accordingly uh, through the different cross sections of the dam and check one of interest like this one. In different planes. And notice how the XMesh and morphine uh, are updated automatically while we move along the dam vertically until we see the section of interest with a channel tube going to the bottom of the dam that goes to the bottom. And we have the ability to cut the sections in different axes and see the resulted cross sections. Like in this example. Now, uh, when it comes to meshing in the industry, uh, this is done for a standard and complex, uh, for a complex model. Uh, for 3D, using Tetra and XI elements, uh, or 2D elements, shells, membranes, plates, uh, that my colleague Matt mentioned, and even 1D for beams, columns, and braces. So this is uh, efficient for modeling joints, assemblies, dams, composites, uh, etc. It has a manual, semi-manual on or an automated uh, mesh generation tools. And this can be used especially for shell modeling, Tetra or XM modeling. And we can easily make the, the, the design changes uh, via the mesh morphing once uh, all the steps are done for the, uh, for the meshing of your model. Uh, and you can dimension the geometry accordingly. The final outcome will be to produce a high quality, high fidelity model, just with the minimal effort from the user's end. And at this point, uh, I would like to open the floor to any questions that you guys may have. I see there are some of them in the, in the questions pane. Uh, we'll be reading a couple of them, uh, Matt and I. Uh, but please, uh, I'll ask you to, to stay in line uh, after the questions part, uh, since we have some uh, communication regarding the upcoming events and ways to stay informed with Altair.
Thanks, Alejandro. Uh, there was one question here that um, I think you touched on a little bit to, after this question was asked, but maybe just to, to be extra thorough here. Um, could you describe, uh, maybe at a high level, why one might use hexa elements versus tetra elements? Um, I think you talked a little bit about that in your presentation. Uh, yes, Matt. Uh, actually, yeah, uh, it is worth mentioning that uh, even, even though tetrahedral mesh uh, is the standard tool uh, used for unstructured mesh, the hexahedral mesh option can be uh, required for a specific solver models. Uh, for example, like concrete material, like we saw in this uh, concrete dam, just to ensure the accurate, uh, accurate results. But the main advantage of tetra over hexa, I will say, will be uh, it will take less steps to get the final mesh, basically. Oh, thank you. Uh, and thank you for the person that asked that question. Um, there's another question. I think I could answer this one here, um, asking when to use solids versus shells. And, you know, this is, a, I, I guess, a somewhat subjective question because uh, we, we have the same question with S-Frame as well. Um, the way I like to, to look at this is um, maybe using some non-technical terms, but when you look at the object you're trying to represent or the, the structure, whatever it is, um the the word i like to use is is chunky does it look like a chunky structure um so maybe a big block of concrete or um a very thick foundation or something like that that might be a good candidate for uh, a solid mesh versus like a 3d mesh versus a, a 2d mesh so a 2d mesh might be better for representing um what we saw like a, a wide flange shape uh, where you've got thin webs and and flanges or maybe a, a shear wall which is relatively thin compared to the other dimensions in the other directions there's another question here uh that was asking about well why should i use hyperworks instead of the the current uh software that you're using well i, I should mention here that um hyperworks does certainly lend a lot of advantages if you're dealing with complex geometry um, also, if you're working with CAD models a lot and you want to mesh them, uh, it can certainly save a lot of time and effort uh, from having to clean up the CAD. Uh, you saw, at least in my example, but I think even with um, Alejandro's a little bit as well, where you don't have to work on the CAD itself, uh, or so you are working in the CAD itself, but not in the CAD software. So rather than creating an, a brand new CAD model every time you need to make an adjustment, you can actually make all those adjustments within Hyperworks. And so I did that within the 2D joint model. Um, and the nice part as well is that it's solver agnostic. You heard me say that earlier. So you're not having to uh, you know, necessarily switch solvers uh, if you're using a solver that you're familiar with, but rather you're, uh, you're, you're basically just presenting the solver with a mesh created from Hyperworks. And maybe to kind of segue into an, another question here, asking about, um, you know, how, how do you get access to Hyperworks? So for those of you that are already on the Altair 1 licensing system, if you have the advanced structural engineer suite, uh, you would actually have access to Hyperworks uh, as well as a variety of other solutions. Uh, I would say if you, if you want more details, contact your account manager, they can certainly explain that more. Uh, Hyperworks requires 21 units of the Altair uh, Advanced Structural Engineer uh, suite. So if you have multiple units, that may be something to look into if you're interested. There is also plenty of training on these tools. Um, so feel free to, uh, to take a look at that in the learning management system. I'll share some information about how to access training in you know, the Altair community and so on uh, afterwards. Maybe just one more question here. Um, this was asking about uh, the example that I shared where we had a, um, I think it must have been from my building example that I was showing. Uh, and they were saying, okay, well, if you have a bridge and you have different types of uh, box used in a box skirter bridge, is there a library available? Uh, so there's not currently any library available, but if you use a sketcher, uh, you can certainly draw any shape you like, and you can inflate that into a 2D or, or a 3D mesh eventually as well. Uh, so that might be an option to consider uh, if you're dealing with that sort of thing. And of course, if you have questions and you're starting to use it, uh, or you're just curious, reach out to us. Again, we'll share the information about how to reach out to the Altair community, 
uh, for information like that. So if you would like to receive the latest notices of webinars, uh, training classes, product releases, and more information, uh, we have this link here. Uh, my colleague Matt is using the chat pane uh, where, that you can access in the GoToWebinar interface uh, with all the links I'm about to show. So please feel free to copy uh, these links, uh, store them somewhere secure in your machine uh, for reference and access. So the Alter website for events, uh, you can go to Alter events, see who are the next ones. Actually, the next event is happening next week. Uh, the future industry event where we are uh, having a lot of speakers uh, that talk about the different industries. Uh, you can register at free cost, just following this link. As for webinar, uh, my colleague Matt already mentioned we are preparing a CFD webinar for November, so please stay tuned with that one if you are interested. Uh, we also have an on-demand webinar about Sim Solid. So please feel free to use this link, just fill up some of your details and you will get access to the recording. Also, as for trainings, uh, you can find information about the next training courses in learnaltera.com or using your Altera account. Filter on S-Frame if you're interested in this particular product. Uh, we have a couple of trainings scheduled for October and November. As for Alter One, uh, you can if you have a an account with Alter and your company already switched to Alter Engineering or you already are there, uh, you can access Marketplace. I'm going to share uh, the next slide uh, how you can uh, dive in while you are in the site uh, to get access to the resources, uh, Marketplace, and so on through Alter One. Uh, the latest release available is 2022.1. You can find this in the Marketplace if you don't have it. Uh, ask your IT to download it on your machine, or you can go and do it by yourself if you have the rights. And lastly, uh, last but not the least, the, the Altair community is the best place to go if you require any help uh, in terms of documentation, videos, or simply just want to communicate with us directly regarding an inquiry, a question, an interest in any other product, feel free to go to the Altair community. And uh, mentioned before, this is the how Alter One looks like. Uh, this is a just filter on the left hand side with the AC structure engineer suites. So these are all the products available. So we have from uh, Hyperworks, uh, SimSolid, Radios, uh, including all the SFRAM solutions. You can download them here. Uh, if you go to the ellipsis button on the top left, uh, you will see further options for support, uh, how to find the marketplace. Uh, or maybe manage your licenses, especially if you're an admin in your organization, or even the resources, similar resources that you will find in Alter community for training, uh, online help. So here's the link. Uh, I'm sure my colleague Matt is sharing that with you guys. Uh, if you go to Alter One, want to learn more about the AEC architecture engineering construction solutions we have, uh, you can navigate right there. Uh, just go to the solutions and select the industry of interest. And the same goes for the products. Uh, if interested in structural engineering, you will see all the products uh, that I already show in my previous slide, the ones from the AC suite. Uh, more in detail with a better description to have a better understanding, especially on those that you may not know already. So, or you can always uh, get in touch with us uh, if you require a trial. Uh, why not drop us an email, uh, maybe a phone call, and we can uh, listen and suggest accordingly. And with this, I would like to thank you all for today's presentation, uh, unless you have something else to say, Matt. Uh, uh, nothing to add, just, yeah, thank you again, and thank you, Alejandro, for your help. Thank you.